19 of your books of praise. So Lord's Day 3, this is our confession. Question, did God then create man so wicked and perverse? Answer, no. On the contrary, God created man good and in his image, that is, in true righteousness and holiness, so that he might rightly know God, his creator, heartily love him and live with him in eternal blessedness to praise and glorify him. Question, from where then did man's depraved nature come? Answer, from the fall and disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, in paradise. For there our nature became so corrupt that we, were, we are all conceived and born in sin. Question, but are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined to all evil? Answer, yes unless we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. This is our confession. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, last week we, we began looking at this first section of the Heidelberg Catechism, our sin and our misery. And we, we looked at how we were homesick travelers, how we, we had this understanding of our sin and misery, the misery of our sin, and that it was this, this sort of feeling of homesickness, of, of knowing that we're not home, and living and dying in the joy of the comfort of belonging to Jesus Christ means that you know where home is, and that you know that you're not home, that you're not there. So that's what we looked at last week. We saw the homesick traveler has a map that we know where home is and we know where we are right now. And that we can see by looking at the map what God created us or what God calls us to be, to love God, to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's where home is and this is where we are, unable to do that. Now this week we're going to dig a little deeper into this this homesickness, this sin and misery, and see that, that not only does knowing our sin and misery mean that we know that we're not home, but it means that we know the story, the story of who we once were, the story of what we became, and then the story about what we are being made. What happens is the story gives us context. The story kind of tells us where we are and we find ourselves in the middle of the story. We find ourselves in a time and a place both in our lives but also in the world in the story of salvation. And just knowing, hey, this is what we're supposed to be like and this is what we're like now doesn't give us the dimension and the depth that we need to truly appreciate our sin and misery, our homesickness and to live and join in the comfort of belonging to Jesus Christ. And that first question in Lord's Day 3 really, really brings it home. Did God really, so did God make us this way? So this is where we are now. This is what we were supposed to look like. We're not there, but, but were we ever like that? Like, are we always, were we always this way? Or did God create us this way? But the story gives us context. It tells us that this home, this place where we are supposed to be, where we love God and we love our neighbor, it's not just a fable, not just a a fable of goodness and wishful thinking, a fable of blessedness that was actually never meant for us, never ours to begin with. It's just something that we have sort of, that we aspire to but can never get to. And so the question's like, where did we come from? How did we get here? How do we get out of here? Those are tough questions to answer. And we often have them and 
failure to understand the questions or to, when we get the wrong answers can, be, can bring people through valleys in their walk of faith and rob them of their comfort, even get them more lost. So we need to know the story. And that's what we're going to do this afternoon. We're going to ask the questions that really get to identity, purpose, direction, that answer fundamental questions about who are we, who were we meant to be, what happened to us, and what's happening now. And so we'll begin as homesick travelers knowing the story a little better. We'll look first at what we were. Now, when we try to understand who we are or who we were meant to be, we can't use ourselves as we are right now as the starting point. Now think about that. That is something that we do. John Calvin pointed out in his institutes, John Calvin, the 16th century reformer, he, he said these words, when, when we study man as he is now and try to determine who he is and what his potential is, We are like an archaeologist looking at the ruins of a building and thinking that this is how the building was meant to look. We are looking at fallen man and trying to determine what we are and what our potential is, but we are looking at the wrong thing and in the wrong place. So the point is we need to not simply look at the ruin of a building, Perhaps you've seen pictures of that, a a building that's just been bombed out or perhaps you've gone somewhere, you know, historic site and you see the sort of, you know, stones kind of hanging around, door arches, and then you look at that and you go, what was that building? I bet you that's what it looked like. And you try to reconstruct it. And Calvin's point is, you can't do that. Because if you look at the ruin, you're, you're never really going to understand who we are and what we were meant to be. You need to look at the original. You need to see our created state. And as Calvin points out, you can only do that by going to God's Word. You know, if you're asking the question, who am I? If you're asking questions of identity, of of personal worth, investigating truth claims about yourself, about the world and how you fit in it and all that... The answer does not lie in just looking inside yourself and trying to find the answers. Self-examination, looking at yourself, that's an important activity. But when it comes to questions of identity and worth and all the other questions, purpose, who you are, who you were meant to be, if you look inside yourself... you just get a closer examination of where you currently are and your own sin and misery. It won't bring you any revelation of something outside of yourself. Now the answer lies actually in looking at Scripture. Scriptural examination, in the examination of God's self-revelation where God tells the story of the world, of who we were created, what we were meant and made to be. We need to look at the palace, not the ruin. That's what our Heidelberg Catechism says in response to the question. Were we always like this? No. And then it says, let me tell you the story about the palace we once were. And it goes to Genesis 1. And we read Genesis 1, 26 to 31 a few moments ago. And there you see the wonder of what God created us to be. And anytime you look at these passages, you this may be review for some of you, but it needs to be pointed out when you look at Genesis 1, 26 to 31. God creates creatures Human beings, the last things he created after the, in the six days of creation, and he creates them in his image. And that really means three things. It means that that's our identity. We're created in his image. It, 
we, were, we don't look like him physically, but there is this sense in which we reflect certain attributes of him. You know, if Paul in Ephesians 4 verse 24 speaks a bit about this when he says that you know, we're created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. When God created us, in Genesis 1, He created us to be like Him, to be His children. And we were completely what we were meant and made to be. And God looks at creation, looks at us, looks at all of creation at the end, and He says, it is very good. doesn't mean that we were simply without sin, but that we were also just beautiful in what we were meant and made to be. It was very good. And then, when we look further at that idea of being made in the image of God, that's our purpose. It has, it has a sense of office. God puts us in the middle of His creation as His representatives, His image bearers, who have this office of, of ruling His creation. Adam and Eve were, were kings and queens of creation. They were vice regents, is the, the word that's often used. God put us in place. What did He do? He told Adam to name the animals. They were to fill the earth. They were to rule it, subdue it. And so when we study man, when we study who we are, we need to understand that our crea- what we were created to be is an identity wrapped up in, in looking like God, righteous, holy, perfect. That we were created with a purpose of ruling royalty and then third we were created to be in relationship with him that he created creatures with whom he could actually have fellowship who could share in his love and those who who were created to be in his image to represent him on earth they also had this meaningful relationship with him we see a little hint of it it's it's in a sad part of the story but God's activity in Genesis 3, 8 of walking in the garden and looking for Adam and Eve. It breaks your heart to read it. But the sense is that it was something that he would do and he went to do it that day and something was wrong. And he's, where are you? He knew exactly where they were, but where are you? What have you done? Where have you gone? Just the glimpse of what it was, what it could have been, indeed what it once was, was the wonder of Adam and Eve walking with the creator of heaven and earth in fellowship with him. A king and a queen ruling under the great king, walking through his creation, looking at what they had rule over, looking at what they were doing in his garden, his kingdom, and walking in righteousness and holiness. That's the beginning of our story. And so when you think about who you are, when you think about where you came from, what your purpose is, it starts there. It doesn't start with the ruin that you see now, trying to make sense of of what's going on right now when you look inside yourself. You start with the palace. You start with where you once were in Adam and Eve before the fall. It may sting a little more. It may be more painful. It might be nice to look at the ruin and then imagine what it could look like. It's always nicer to do that. Well, it looks like this right now. It looks horrible, but we could make it better. But the scriptural story says, no, you start from how beautiful it was and then you look at how messed up it got. And it hurts. It increases that sense of homesickness, but that's where you begin. Living and dying in the joy and the comfort of belonging to Jesus Christ means you need to see your palace, your home, in all its glory. You know, in movies we see people in bad situations, you know, finding out, it's also in books, you know, people in, in lousy situations, or they're poor, they're imprisoned, or whatever, and then you find out that they're actually incredibly important, they're royalty. You know, 
You can think of it, you know, Disney movies. You know, I think of movies that watched in our family, you know, Princess Diaries, Snow White, Cinderella. You know, this idea that there is this somebody who's just living a life that is so broken and so, so sad and then something happens and you find out that there's like this hidden greatness. There's a story they didn't know about when it comes to who they are and it's, it's there. And there is this sense, just when you look out in culture, there is this story that's imprinted, it seems, on our minds, isn't it? You know, the story of us being creatures of significance and meaning and purpose with whole and fulfilling and beautiful relationships. that's imprinted on our brains and our minds. But when you look inside, just look inside yourself and try to find that, you're just going to be looking at the ruin of that. There is this sense in the world around us that the answer is, yes, you have that longing for, for identity, for purpose, for relationships, and the answer is look inside yourself and find that inner person because somewhere inside you is this person, this creature, this identity, purpose, relationship, whatever, that just wants to come out. But the problem is when you look inside, what you see are longings for identity, for purpose, and for relationship. And when we, re when we hear the story of what we once were, when we see it in God's Word, we that story fills in and informs our homesickness. It, there, there's remnants of our created identity, our created purpose, our created relationships, and we see what they were supposed to be, what they were meant and made to be, and then we begin to understand the feeling of homesickness in our hearts, that when we long for for when we want to know who we are, when we want to know why we're here, when we want to know our purpose, when we, when we have longings for, for relationships, we begin to see why we have those longings. It's because that's what we were created for. We were created in the image of God. We were created to rule. We were created to live in relationship with Him. And the story that we find ourselves in right now does not look like that. And so when you go back to the beginning of the story, you begin to understand that's where these feelings come from. And it might make you feel a little worse, but it helps you understand why we live with this sin and misery. We're separated from God. We're not who we were meant and made to be. The relationship was broken. So we need to look at the next part of the story, what we became. Because as every person here knows, something went wrong with the story. Not one of us here is living up to what they were meant and made to be. That, that identity, it's always under attack. It's, it's, we look at ourselves and we see the ruin we we look at the way in which we live in the world and we see we're part of the problem. We're not, we're not ruling, leading, doing anything to help or to subdue or to improve the world. We're actually part of the problem. And when we look at our relationships, not only are our relationships frayed and broken, but we're part of the reason they're frayed and broken. Something went wrong with our story. We're not that palace that Genesis 1, 26 to 31 describes. And in Genesis 1, Genesis 3, verses 1 through, through 7, we read the account of the fall, the story of what, what, what went wrong. And it's an event that the rest of Scripture, the story of redemption, proceeds from. This event, Genesis 3, sets in motion the rest of the story, so to speak. You know, if you, 
If you remove the fall, the story of the fall, the whole story falls apart. You need to know this part of the story. You need to know what happened, what we became. And sometimes we want to stay away from this part. We don't want to be reminded of it. Or it becomes part of a story that we're sort of like, oh, yeah, I guess that's one way of looking at it. I suppose it's a, a story that we tell ourselves about why things went wrong. But I really like the story of Jesus. I like the story of everything being made better. But let's not talk about sin. And even within the church, that is a tendency. I think I might have shared this before, but somebody I know is was in the Christian music industry, and, which is run out of Nashville, and it is very difficult to write songs that deal with sin, or at least it was when he was in it. The songs need to be warm and happy about how Jesus makes me feel good about myself. You don't get into sin. You don't get into brokenness. You don't get into all that. They're supposed to be happy songs. But the problem is that We're not always happy. Something's broken. Something's wrong. To quote Carl Truman, he says, where do miserable Christians go? What songs do miserable Christians sing? And what he meant was, what do Christians who realize their sin and misery, realize the brokenness of this world, what songs do they sing? And so a lot of times we don't want to sing them. We don't want to talk about it, but we need to deal with this part of the story because what we have with the fall into sin, what we have with Genesis 3, is this, this event that happened in time that shattered the image of God in us and corrupted us, made us unable to carry out our office and destroyed our relationship with God. It's a story of our rebellion against God. And their story is our story. That's something that's so important to understand as you, as you read Scripture because Some have argued and some will argue that, yeah, that's just Adam and Eve's story. It's not your story. Adam and Eve sinned, not you. Theologians have wrestled with that. How does the original sin, the sin of these two people living thousands and thousands of years ago, how does that impact us today? How does it impact our story? And here we need to to kind of dive into some theology here to understand it because I do think that there is a sense in which Adam and, Adam and Eve are, the sin of Adam and Eve is somewhat distant from us and we don't, we sometimes have a hard time coming to terms with why we're sinners, why it's such a big deal. And so as we look at sin, and why it matters for a story, we need to understand two parts of it, guilt and pollution. Now, guilt means that God looks at us as human beings and sees us as connected to Adam and Eve and then guilty of the sin, of the rebellion that they brought into the world. Adam is our king, our ruler, he's head of us, and he brought us into sin, and it doesn't matter if you didn't do any sin The fact that you are part of the human race means you are connected to the guilt of sin. The illustration I often use for catechism students is that if Prime Minister Trudeau declared war on another country, even if you didn't want to go to war with that country, you were still going to war with that country because you belong to Canada and he's your Prime Minister. But what's interesting is that in Lord's Day 3, the focus is on pollution, not so much on guilt, the focus is on pollution, on the corruption of our nature. So what we have when we look at the story is, it's not simply the story of Adam and Eve and okay, well that's also your sin now because you're connected to them. No, it's the story of how in Adam and Eve, our very nature became corrupted. You can see that in question and answer 7. You know, from the fallen disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve in paradise, for there our nature became so corrupt that we are all conceived and born in sin. So 
So what's emphasized is that Adam and Eve are our parents. They did something, and it impacted the very nature of all their children. What happened with Adam and Eve, what happened in Genesis 3, means that there is this corruption of the entire nature of human beings. You know, David, Psalm 51 sings of that. Even in my mother's womb, I was a sinner, born and conceived in sin. Ephesians 2, you know, God gave us life, but we brought death and sin into the world. We made ourselves dead in sin. That's who we are. We're dead. We're a ruin of what God created us to be. And we made ourselves that. That's what we became. And then we look a little further. As we go through the story, we see the story of what we were meant and made to be, the story of what we became, sinners separated from God, not who we were meant and made to be, broken relationship. And then that last question in Lord's Day 3, is there no hope? Is this the end of the story? Are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined to all evil? Is this the end of the story? You know, we need to remember that as we look at the story, we do this as those who have been saved in Jesus Christ. It's important to remember as you look at the Heidelberg Catechism, and especially this first part, that we believe in Jesus Christ, we know the end of the story, and so we're asking these questions, knowing that there's more to the story. And sometimes we can forget that as we look at our sin and misery. Our homesickness, our consideration of our homesickness is done in the knowledge that we are going home. We're just not there right now. And, and we're, we're digging deeper into that, that misery, that sin, And so what we're doing is we look more closely and what question and answer 8 in our hybrid catechism does is really just two things. One is, is it really that bad? That's the first part. Are you sure? Like, is this our story? This is where we are? And the answer is simply yes. This is what we made ourselves. This is who we are. There's no better man inside. Deeper down, we're not some nice people just looking to get nursed back to life. No, we're dead. The devil promised something and he lied. We didn't get it and we don't currently have it. And in the fall, we failed. And the route of looking to ourselves is just not an option. We're inclined to evil, to sin. That's the first part. The second part, though, is that we don't stay there. The story isn't over. Because it says, yes, the answer, unless we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. In other words, there's more to the story. There is something called regeneration. There is something about new life by the Spirit of God that is a way forward. But apart from that, yes, It's the end of our story. We are who we have been made by sin. And apart from rebirth, new life by the Spirit, that's where we stay. And so the one who belongs to to Jesus Christ answers the question of what's happening, what we are being made by saying, I know the story of what we once were. I know the story of what we have been made in sin, in the fall into sin, and in our brokenness right now. But I know there's more to the story. I know where my home is. And I know that my hope is in the Lord and in Jesus Christ. That I ask these questions as one who knows that my only comfort in life and in death body and soul, is that I belong to Jesus Christ, my faithful Savior. That He's saved me from all of it. I'm asking these questions as somebody who already knows that, knows the whole story. But in order to appreciate the whole story, we need to know this part. 
So we know that something is going on. We know that something more is coming. Our story is not over. We don't boast in ourselves. We boast in the work of God by His Spirit. You know, Paul says that Ephesians 2.10, we boast in what God is doing in us by His grace, not in ourselves, not in what we do. We boast in the Spirit. We boast in the new man, the second Adam, Jesus. The work of Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, that's our hope. We're being remade, reborn. The old nature is being put to death. And looking at our homesickness, looking at our sin and misery is part of the way we expose it and where we see it put to death. We know that we're dead and we need new life. A life that we cannot generate. Only God can do that. Sin's there, sin will always be there. But we know the full story. That in Christ, we will have the victory. That we will have the joy of the comfort of belonging to Him. But let us make sure we understand our homesickness so that we want to go home. And knowing the story means you know more deeply and more dearly that desire to go home. Because if you don't have the feeling of homesickness, if the story does not create in you a deeper longing, then this life is somewhere where you do feel at home, where there is something about the story of this life in the here and now that is enough to give you some kind of comfort. But the gospel is that the larger story, the story of what God has done in Jesus Christ, means we're not home and we long to be home, and we want to hear more about the story, about what God's doing us, doing to bring us home. Amen.